Hello and welcome back to Charis with me Charlotte and my canine buddy Huxley. I have wanted to make one of these update videos on my long COVID journey for so long but I have been sort of gagged by an insurance claim like I haven't been able to talk online um, and I will go into that in more detail later in the video uh, but yeah I am just so glad to be free now and I can talk freely and I really want to share what's gone on with my long COVID journey. I'll let the dog go, go on. So before we get deep into it a bit of background I did have three vaccines. I had the Pfizer jab and I think I had my last one at the start of December 2021 and then I caught COVID for the first time almost two years to the day on the 21st of January 2022. I had a fairly mild infection uh, but I kind of proceeded to get worse in ways I wasn't noticing for a few weeks and then I thought I was I was getting slowly better over the next couple of months and then in June I caught Covid again and that's what really set me back and I've been basically at the same level since then. I also caught Covid shortly after I made my last video in December 2020 two so three COVID infections in one year that was great um, but that didn't really impact my long-term symptoms at all. So in this video we're going to go through all of my symptoms whether or not they've changed any interventions that have been made either by professional medical people or just by myself or my own steed and we're also going to talk about this illness's impact on my life and work and money situations. So let's start with general fatigue and this is something that I haven't seen any improvement in I don't think uh, basically since June 2022. My fatigue is accompanied by POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which basically means my heart can't deal with being upright. Um, and I do think that has improved a little bit. Like I can stand unsupported for like a few seconds now without like having to immediately sit down. I don't know whether I'm just like naturally laying myself out more so I'm like fighting myself less or whether that's an actual improvement but the fatigue is still very significant. I lie down almost all day either on the sofa or in bed. Um, this is going to be the longest I've sat up for quite a while. So yeah I'm just exhausted most of the time and I now identify as having ME-CFS which is chronic fatigue syndrome um, a lot of people consider long COVID and ME-CFS to be exactly the same. Uh, I consider ME to be more of like the fatigue aspects of the long COVID. And as I haven't really improved in my fatigue in the last two years, that does speak more to ME, uh, which is a much longer term issue. And there isn't enough research about it and it's just not really very curable. You just kind of have to wait and hope things get better and hope things don't just get worse. Describing the severity of my fatigue, um, I like to use action for ME's functional ability scale. And on that, I average probably around 50%, which is moderate to severe. So that means I do have to be lying down a lot. I struggle with lots of stimulation, um, but I can take care of myself. Although I can't really like go out alone. So I still use a walking stick. Um, walking sticks I talked about in my last video. I now have two. The one I had originally broke, uh, but I have this one, which is like a uh, black one with a little, little metal collar and a cherry handle, but it's chipped a lot. So I probably need to get a new one. And then I have what I call my fancy walking stick. So the other one folds up there. I take it more places, but this is my like wooden carved one that I wear to events where, what am I saying? Whenever I go outside, I'll take my walking stick and I really don't walk far. I've in, in some ways I, I walk even less than I used to. I'm getting so much better at um, measuring like how much I can handle and I really try not to push it on an average day at all. So I don't go very far, but even if I'm being like driven somewhere and I don't know, going to a pub, I will like be driven there, take my walkie stick, walk into the pub. <laughs> Most of the time that just like slightly alleviates um, the amount of effort I have to put into walking because it's an extra support but then occasionally when I'm feeling really bad I like literally need it to stand up. Since last time we spoke I also got another mobility aid which is my scooter. This is a seated electric scooter, it's called the Windgoo B9 and um, it is really great in that now I can like I can take my dog for a walk on the park like he trots along alongside of me and before that I I like could occasionally walk to the park with my walking stick but it would take a lot out of me. This is fantastic because I can like go on walks with friends on you know flat level ground and uh, and not really use up any energy doing it which is excellent. Um, the only problems are that A it doesn't really have enough energy to go uphill and I live on a hill so I do have to sort of like push myself up 
the hill as well when I'm going up this hill, which is annoying. And the other thing is that um, it's illegal. So <laughs> electric scooters in the UK are illegal um, for anything but private land use. So you can't use them on roads, you can't use them on pavements. Um, but obviously people do, right? You're, you're used to seeing people ride electric scooters. You can get a 300 pound fine and six points on your driving license. So that is a thing I am scared about, six points on your license, but it's really up to a police officer to just make a judgment call on that. I think they'd probably be more lenient if it's for a mobility issue, but who knows? I also bought these disabled stickers, like the wheelchair badge to put on the front and the back. Um, and when I first started going out in it, I would get like quite a lot of weird looks of being like, you're a young person on a scooter, you're really lazy. And like, I've literally been called lazy to my face in the park before. Um, and then I'm like, I, I can't walk, so um, that I need to use this. But I think a lot of people will like see it, have like make a judgment and then like look down and see that it has um, like an accessible badge on it and then feel bad about themselves. <laughs> I paid 400 pounds for it and I've definitely got my money's worth. I think I got it last June. Um, and I kind of would like to upgrade to a, like a more powerful one that can get me up the hill easily. Um, and that would cost like 900 pounds, but it is definitely not in the budget now, but maybe in the future. Okay, let's move on to my fatigue episodes, which is just part of chronic fatigue syndrome. Like you, you fluctuate, you feel worse sometimes, but I have like very acute, severe fatigue episodes, which I've talked about in my previous videos and they're very worrying. They usually come with pretty bad leg pain and um, a lot of sound sensitivity. I might like, generally have quite a bit of sound sensitivity, but when I'm feeling really bad, the sound sensitivity absolutely ramps up. And again, there's been no improvement in the like threshold of exercise that I can do before I get one of these crashes. But as I said, I am getting better at managing them. So I have fewer of the like huge crashes where I've like totally overexerted myself and then I'm completely wiped out. I have a lot more mini crashes. So I might have like tiny crashes throughout the day where Brian will come downstairs to talk to me and like him just speak, I could be fine. And then him speaking to me like suddenly zones me out and I'm like, what, what's going on? So although I feel a bit more in control, like I I can prevent the, the really big ones, it's still a huge problem for me. I can't go out alone because I could just have one of these things and be totally stuck. The mini ones I might have around the house just make me go a bit like slack jawed, unable to concentrate, unable to speak or like move significantly um, for, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes. But if I have a really bad one, I will have to be like prostrate on the floor, will have to like nap for hours and won't be able to like really communicate or move. The moving thing is really weird because when I first started experiencing these, I'd be like fully paralyzed. But now with these mini ones, I get much more of a sense of like how it feels in my muscles. It's almost like the connection's missing in my brain. It's like I'm trying really hard and it's not happening. But if I say, oh, you're just gonna get out of bed, like sort of the reflex movement allows me to do it. And like that might feel kind of exhausting once I've done it, but I can do the movement if that makes sense. I don't know, it's very weird. The problem is that my threshold for exertion before I have a crash is still quite low. And there are some times where I want to push myself because it's a big event or whatever, and it just ends badly. It always ends badly. My brother got married last May and I was really good all day. I sat down all the time, of course, and like threw the dinner that was in this big room that was really echoey. There was so much sound and I was like halfway through the start even. And I was like, I just need to go sit in the other room for a minute. I think I'm okay, but I just need to go sit down and be in a quiet space for a few minutes. And then when I got to the quiet space, I was like, oh no, I feel terrible. Can someone take me upstairs? And I had to basically, I had to sleep for a few hours. I came back for a little bit of dancing. I mean, I didn't dance. I sat there on a chair but like, <laughs> to see the first dance and stuff. And, uh, and then I just had to go back to bed. My dad also got married last month. And although the day only started at 4 p.m., um, towards the end of the dinner, I was I was doing really fine. I was drinking quite a lot, to be fair. Um, but it was in a small area, so I wasn't moving around a lot. Uh, but I just suddenly like just couldn't handle it at all and had to be like taken upstairs by two people and then I didn't come back down again. One of the worst ones and most annoying ones is that I went to Pride in August. So I live in Brighton. It has a very big Pride parade, possibly the biggest in the UK um, that takes place in August. And we live quite close to the center of town. So um, I really wanted to participate this year, but I wanted to do it in a way that was like minimal exertion. So we came up with this plan where I would ride my scooter down to the parade, enjoy the parade, scoot home. And then maybe if later I wanted to go to the street party, I could 
um, get a taxi down there and I had a little folding seat and I could sit and enjoy the street party, have all my friends dance around me and then get a taxi home. So I went down to the parade. I was sat on my little stool there as well and enjoyed myself a lot and went back home for, um, for lunch. And I was like, you know what? I think I can do it. I'm gonna go down. Uh, to the street party and again I sat down my little stool had a really fun time and then the next on Sunday was also a street party and I was like yesterday went amazing I'm gonna do that again um, because I, I just barely moved but then the next week it was just a downward spiral and I spent almost all of August in bed flat like not really being able to think or do anything and that was the first time that I realized it's not just physical exertion that gets me, it's general sensory exertion. So just being around lots of lots of people, lots of music. I don't know how I managed to not crash during the weekend, uh, but I was an absolute wreck for weeks afterwards. I had to cancel a ton of plans and even like three weeks later, it was a friend's um, baby shower and 30th birthday event and I was dead set on going. Um, so I went and it, we were having like this nice brunch for the baby shower and I like could barely speak. Like I brought these photos to do a little game and someone was like, oh Charlotte, do you wanna do the game? And I was like, I can't lift up the photos. So can someone else do that? Um, and that was three weeks after overexerting myself. It's it's crazy how intense the crashes can be. So that's all the fatigue stories for today. Um, let's move on to my issues with my vision. Uh, so I talked about this in previous videos. It's quite an unusual symptom to have from long COVID, uh, but basically I can't read. I still can't read um, because my brain really struggles to interpret large amounts of complex visual information. But this is slowly improving. I felt a lot at the start of my illness and actually after every infection that I was very kind of fizzy. It was like I was like overcharged or like there was just more kind of current going through my system. Like it's really hard to explain, but it was this general like, edginess that I felt in all of my senses and that has been the thing that slowly relaxed. So although reading still super exhausts me if I you know try to read a paragraph or like a page that has a lot of stuff on it, um, it's it's more like the effort of trying to read it causes me to have fatigue rather than like being physically incapable of doing it. If that makes sense. I started driving again last April, May, which is really nice. Beforehand, it felt really dangerous because I couldn't keep track of things in my peripheral vision. Um, but now it's all right as long as I don't have a little fatigue episode. And it's sort of, um, when I have been driving and felt dodgy, it's either because I like wanted to drive for half an hour to go pick something up from Facebook Marketplace, which is just like too long for me to try and keep track of things, or, I've been like stopped at a red light, which is obviously terrifying and dangerous. And when that's happened, I've been like, I need to just pull over and like sit for a bit. Um, because often like when I'm doing things, when I'm like moving about, I can keep it up. And it's only when you like pause that it's much harder, which is why like sitting at a desk and doing work at a desk seemed really impossible to me. But like doing like household chores and moving around is a bit easier. This is natural improvement. I will get onto my dealings with neurology later on, uh, but I am hopeful that I will be able to read by the end of the year some amount. Um, I probably could now, but I'd have to be really, really measured about how I do it. And it's not a good use of my daily allotment of energy, reading for pleasure. Uh, but yeah, I am excited to get back to that. I would like some recommendations of poetry because I'm not very into poetry, but I feel like that would be a good way to get in. It's short, there's not too much on the page. So if you have any poetry recommendations, I'm not specific about what they're about or who they're by, just give me, give me anything. And I do really want to get back into reading, not just because I love to read and I love stories, but it's starting to make me feel a bit weird having like a graveyard of books behind me. Um, it just feels like it represents an older me and I don't know, book sh bookshelves should like evolve with you and what you're learning. And I feel like this is sort of stuck at the start of 2022. And, and it makes me feel really sad and icky and it makes it feel more, makes it feel more performative as like a look at all of the books I have rather than like actually being part of me because it isn't a part of my life at the moment. But hopefully it will be before the end of my life. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the medical interventions I have had. I will start with the long COVID clinic in my NHS trust area. I mentioned in my last video how I was under the care of the long COVID clinic and I had some CBT therapy with them and I was on the wait list for a fatigue appointment. And basically what happened is that I had finally got 
a fatigue appointment booked in for August last year. But in the kind of early summer, I was thinking more about having ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, rather than long COVID and thinking that the actual ME clinic in my local area would be a better place for me to get support because it's more specialized to my symptoms. People have had experience with it for much longer. Like I just felt like that would that's the place I needed to be. So I said this to my GP and she was like, yeah, I can refer you to the ME clinic. And then she did and the ME clinic came back and said that they can't take me on if I'm still with the long COVID clinic and I would have to be out of the long COVID clinic for three or six months before I could join the ME clinic. I guess they want it to be like, this is a different problem. Um, but yeah, so then I was really torn because I was like, that seems <laughs> that seems like a big risk. Uh, but yeah, then it came to the day of this fatigue appointment. I was really ill on that day, so I just couldn't do it. And I had no way to phone them or tell them that I wasn't gonna be able to show up for this call. And then I got a letter from the long COVID clinic. It's actually called PCAS, Post COVID Assessment Support Services, something like that. Um, I letter from PCAS saying, hey, you missed your appointment, call this thing to reschedule by this date. And I was sort of torn because I was waiting to hear back from my doctor about whether she thought the best idea for me would be to leave the long COVID clinic. And um, I didn't hear from her in that time. So the next thing I know, I get a letter being like, you've been discharged from PCAS because you failed to like be in contact with us basically. And I was like, oh no, that's annoying. But I guess this, at least I can, pursue the ME <laughs> thing again. So we got back in touch with the ME clinic and they were like, uh, you can't refer directly to us because if you have long COVID, you have to be referred through PCAS, through the long COVID clinic. <sighs> so I was like, okay. So you said I had to not be in it and I was saying I have to be in it and go through there. My GP was like, this is just what it's like sometimes. It could be weirdly cyclical. Do you want me to re-refer you to PCAS? I said, yes, if that's the only way to get me through, <laughs> please do it. And I finally had my intake the other day and like luckily we could breeze through it because she was like, you're already on our system. We have all the answers to everything. Um, and I said, can you refer me to the ME clinic? And she said, yes, I can. Uh, but the wait times for the ME clinic is like three months or something like that. And we now actually have availability for our fatigue sessions much faster than that. Um, so would you rather talk to one of our fatigue specialists first and then they can refer you on if, if like that's still what you want? Um, and I was like, yeah, why not? So, um, I booked in, I think the next week or the week after a appointment, a fatigue appointment. Um, the only problem with this is that the reason I, main reason I wanted to be with the ME clinic is that I thought they would have treatment. I mean, I'm still not sure if this is, this is true, but I thought they'd have actual treatment pathways or like things to try. Whereas PCAS is much more support. It's just like how to manage your daily life with the thing, like what you can, what you can change um, to improve your fatigue. And I have been through like the living with long COVID course. I know all about pacing. I know all of the things I've done, all of the things sensibly. So I really feel at this point, it would just be nice to get to a doctor who's like, let's throw some, some pills at it and see if anything helps. So I'm still hoping that that happens at some point. Next up is cardiology. Um, so I said in my last video that I was referred by my GP to cardiology for a treatment for POTS, the postural prostatic can't stand up thing. I was referred and I had an echocardiogram in March, which is like an ultrasound of your heart basically. And then I haven't heard since. Um, so I've just been waiting on having an actual appointment and there's nothing I can do about it. I know that I'm on their books. I know I'm on the wait list and I just, I just wait. Now, neurology, um, as I said in my last video, I was referred to neurology and had a meeting with a neurologist who thought they could possibly help me using drugs for epilepsy, specifically for my vision. Um, and I tried two drugs. I tried carbamazepin um, and I had a lower dosage. And then I think just in my last video, I just upped my dosage. The week after my last video, I got COVID classic and then the week after that I got this rash all over my body I'll see if I can find pictures that represent it I'm not sure I will be able to but um it was this awful awful rash everywhere and it was itchy and it felt horrible like it was on my upper lip and stuff and like you probably couldn't have seen it very visibly um but it made me just feel terrible all the time and I went to the doctor and they were like yeah I don't know it's not really it can't really be a COVID thing so I think it's uh contact 
um, dermatitis. So they thought that maybe post that COVID infection, I just had like an increased sensitivity to something in my laundry detergent or something like that. Um, and I had changed my laundry detergent recently, not to a new brand, but like to a, a fresh big bottle of, <laughs> of, the, of, the, of the stuff that I normally use. But they could have been years difference because they were separate bulk orders. Um, so I thought I'll cut that out and hopefully it'll go away. And I cut that out and it didn't get any worse. Um, but then it was still really bad on the lead up to Christmas and I couldn't sleep. I literally was, I'd, one night I had four baths to try and soothe myself. And on Christmas Eve at four or 5 a.m. I just drove to A&E because I was like, I cannot handle this. I cannot live like this anymore. Like I need someone to do something about it. Um, and they sent me away because they were also like contact dermatitis. But then when I managed to speak to um, an out of hours doctor later, they were like, I think it's because you upped your carbamazepine dosage. Um, like it's weird for like upping a dosage or like it, it was also like delayed for upping the dosage, but he was, he was basically like, stop using that drug. And like, you don't even need to taper off, just stop using it and see if that works. And it did, which is a miracle because, oh my God, Christmas, it was so horrible. Like I was in Ireland and stuff and I was just itchy and all, it was so bad. Anyway, I was still really hopeful that my vision could be improved with medicine. So we went on to a different drug called Lamotrigine. And I was on that for, I think two months before I had an appointment with the consultant neurologist again. And he was basically like, look, if neither of these have shown any signs of improvement, then I just don't think it's gonna work for you. Like if, if one of them helped a bit, then we could like play with dosages and stuff. But if you're having no effect, then like, I don't think that's gonna be very hopeful. So we gave up, which is a shame, but he did say, and it has borne out that he thought he was pretty confident that my vision would improve slowly over time because the brain is very good at repairing itself. And I said, are you relying on like my fatigue improving over time? And he was like, no, different beast. That's your entire body. Your brain like should fix itself over time and it might take years, but like it will get better. And I now believe him and think that eventually someday I will be okay. Part of that neurology process was also getting an MRI to just sort of check on things. Uh, but I had this whole complication with not being able to do it because I have magnets in my fingers. So I, the NHS trust safety expert said, no, 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 we do not want you having an MRI with magnets. Uh, and the neurologist was basically like, look, I could, I could get you to take them out and have an MRI, but now I've done quite a few years of seeing long COVID patients, seeing their MRIs. I really don't think it's gonna bring up anything that we don't already know. And I think it would just be like a waste of everyone's time and energy and like hope. But one thing that he did organize to sort of set my mind at ease was this neuropsychological assessment uh, to basically find out if there are any holes in my cognition. And I have the results right here. Oh, I also have my, um, my echocardiogram results. So if this means anything to anyone, please explain it to me. Uh, presumably it's okay, or I would have expected to have heard back from them in the last nine months. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so the neuropsychological assessment was really fun. It was like an hour, an hour and a half, sitting with a doctor and him going through all of these like different kind of cognitive tasks. So it would be like, can you explain the definition of this list of like increasingly difficult words, attaching an image to a word and like having to learn a bunch of them and then they say the word and you have to say the image or vice versa. Um, there was one where he told me a story and I had to say it back to him like word for word and then he tell again, I had to say it back to him. And then like half an hour later, he was like, hey, can you tell me that story again? Oh, it was so really fun. And it was comforting even throughout the process because it was very clear that like I was doing a good job at it. Um, and I, I guess most people that have these assessments are either uh, like post brain op or they potentially have dementia or something like that. So I think he was also like slightly entertained by having someone that like there wasn't any Thing particularly to look out for and we were just having fun doing a test. They judge it against the level of functioning they would expect from your education occupation. So for me, he was judging it against like someone that has a master's degree, how would they do in these areas? While this was comforting and he did say like, it looks like there's no actual problem with your cognitive domains, but it is more about the effort that you have to use up to, um, to use your brain in that way. So it's more like I'm just very easily exhausted by doing these difficult cognitive tasks. And this was obviously done in a way where I was as unfatigued as I could have been that day. Like the room was set up for me, like lights off, blinds down, 
a very quiet, like, so it was the best, like, circumstances for my brain to work. Um, but it's still, like, I did find a few of these still a bit concerning. Uh, for example, like, my visuospatial skills were in the 50th percentile, and I have a very high IQ. I've been blessed with genius level IQ, um, and I know that I have good visuospatial skills, like, I know that. So that and, um, that and also, like, word search. I don't remember which one this would fall into. Oh, maybe it's the delayed memory, um, 63rd percentile, but, like, I would have expected myself to have done better in that in the past. This was interesting and like mostly comforting, but it, the, the problem is, is that they don't know what I was like <laughs> before this, you know? Okay, let's move on to um, like my GP. Uh, as I said, my GP has been like helping me trying to get into the ME clinic and all that kind of thing. Uh, but she's also been helping me with my mental health. Um, I have had some other really bad and difficult things happen to me this year, which I will talk about later on in the video. Um, so I was prescribed propranolol, which is a beta blocker for panic basically. Uh, for anxiety, which I have had in the past and I've used occasionally, but I've been using it more systematically at certain points this year, like max dosage a day, um, all approved by my, my GP, and that helps. Um, some people use beta blockers for long COVID and think that they help generally improve their symptoms. I don't find that myself, like it's just been through mental health support. Um, also, sertraline, I did go on sertraline back in the summer of 22. That was because my GP thought that SSRIs could help with my fatigue and it didn't, but because I was like going through quite a stressful time, uh, you know, with being chronically ill and all, um, I was like, I kind of want to keep on them. And I went up to, from 50 to 100 milligrams. And I was on that from uh, sort of autumn 2022. And then until I think around May last year, um, I was sudden, I was just like, one day I was like, you know what, I'm actually, kind of in control. And then I, I started taking them like every other day. And then I was like, you know what? I'm I'm crying a lot this weekend, but it's an appropriate emotional reaction to <laughs> what's going on. And that feels good and fine. So I went off them. Uh, and then when this terrible thing happened in September, that again, we're gonna get onto later, I was like, I desperately need <laughs> some uh, something to stop spiraling all the time and feeling really awful all the time. So I went back on surgery at 50 milligrams and then I sort of accidentally went back up to 100 over Christmas because I just took the wrong pill packet with me on my Christmas trip. Um, I didn't realize until I was like quite deep into it. So when I came back, I've stayed on 100. I can feel the difference. I used to think that it didn't affect me at all. Like when I first went on it, I was like, I feel no different. Now I can really tell, especially because when I, um, when this thing went down in September, I was having uh, like anxiety attacks. I was feeling really bad and spirally, couldn't sleep all the time. And I noticed a very distinct difference between that and immediately going on the sertraline. And then I again noticed a difference uh, like this month, the way I've been handling difficult things. It's great because I feel like it just stops me from my worst instincts of catastrophizing. And I'm my brain is whirring all the time. So it really helps calm calm it down a little bit. I've been really enjoying that. It's not directly related to my long COVID symptoms, uh, but it just is really good. And I would like to tell you if you are having any mental health problems, just be open to trying medication for it. Um, it doesn't feel like it's hampered any of the joy in my life. It just means that I feel less terrible. <laughs> I've also had a private therapist um, that I think I got November 22. Uh, after having had the CBT from PCAS that wasn't really good. Um, so I've had this private therapist I've seen weekly and I've really enjoyed that. It's been really, really helpful in the tough times. And then in the not so tough times, it's been good to work on personal development and relationships and that. Like when I started, my main thing was my identity as somebody that used to be very, very productive, very active, um, very ambitious like trying to reform that around like the idea of having a long-term chronic illness and like how do I who am I you know um so I feel like I worked through a lot of that stuff with her uh and I stopped seeing her like two weeks ago because I can't afford her anymore frankly um again we'll come on to that later uh and uh, but I'm sort of okay like I feel like even though it's a really really difficult time I'm like equipped you know I'm I I have all of the resources I need and I have the support I need. So that's good. 
that's all good. Next, I'm going to talk about the personal interventions I've made to try and improve my symptoms. I am not somebody that will try absolutely anything to try and cure myself because I find that very emotionally exhausting and trying to like keep track of how I'm feeling every single day. I don't enjoy it. I don't like being, I don't like treating myself as a, as a test rabbit. Um, but I do like trying things that I've seen like really positive stories from, consistently positive stories and things that have been like clinically proven to help. One of the things I tried was fasting. Um, I did a 72 hour fast last April. I want to say this is clinically proven to improve your immune system. It basically works by killing off all of your white blood cells. So they have to regenerate and hopefully they regenerate as like better white blood cells. I was hoping that this might improve my fatigue. I didn't see much about um, this being able to improve people's fatigue, but it definitely improves people's immune system. So I was like, maybe, you know, this can help me in some way. I found over the 72 hours, I was actually fine. If you just drink water, you don't get hungry. It's a dangerous thing to know because I definitely can use food as control sometimes. Um, and knowing that like, I'm actually absolutely fine if I only drink water is a bit dangerous. So I do have to be careful with that. And I would not advise this if you have any like history of eating disorders. Um, but other than that, I didn't feel any worse over the time. I did crash afterwards, but like not disproportionately. Um, and I did not experience any improvement in my fatigue, but I did definitely, definitely have a better immune system. I am like quite a sickly person. I would get colds all the time. I'm just like generally quite sickly. And for three months solid, I didn't have like a single cough or cold or like headache or anything. Like it was amazing. And I also had unrelatedly some like blood tests done uh, a few weeks after. And comparing them to blood tests I had done six months before, I had double the white blood cell count. I'm not a medical professional. I do not know what that means, but I just thought it's very significant that like it literally definitely increased my white blood cell count. And it's something that I would really consider doing again. I've wanted to do it since. I wanted to do it like just before winter so I could avoid getting winter colds and stuff. Um, thankfully managed to avoid COVID this winter, which is great, but um, you do kind of need to be prepared to for like it to feel really crap for a few days. And um, especially if you like, for example, I live with a partner, he's got to continue eating and the temptation is just tricky. So you need to really prepare yourself. I'd also would not recommend doing a 72 hour fast right out the bat. Um, most people that do actual like solid fasting rather than intermittent fasting would recommend you do a 24 hours and then a 48 hours before you try a 72 hours, just so you know how your body reacts to it. Um, but I found it really cool I actually found it just really empowering to know that I could I could do that, you know? And I would definitely like to do it again at some point in the future. Next thing I tried was the autoimmune protocol diet. So this is a really low inflammatory diet. So you don't eat anything that could possibly inflame your gut, which is most things, but it's also kind of like unintuitive things. So it's, it's most like the keto diet where you prioritize fats. Um, so meats, fishes, uh, like, avocados, that kind of thing. But you also can't have any grains or nuts or nightshades. So you can have all the vegetables apart from peppers, tomatoes, and potatoes. Um, but then of course, no rice, no pasta. Uh, you're suddenly like, what is there to eat? <laughs> like, <laughs> there was really like no bread, no dairy, no dairy. Um, so it really does restrict your diet when I am like quite a big, I'm quite a buttery, potatoey, pastry gal. I love the, the beige foods. Um, but what I, I basically every day would eat sweet potato, because you have sweet potato, just not normal potato, sweet potato and salmon. And it was actually really nice. I did this for three weeks of not having, of being very strictly on the autoimmune protocol diet. So this is like a, a diet that people use when they're trying to figure out um, like if they have an allergy or if they if they just have like IBS, they wanna know what triggers it. You basically restrict it to these things that should not cause you any gut issues. And then you slowly add other things back in to see if they then trigger a response. Um, I do not have any gut issues at all. 
uh, I've, yeah, I have like quite a, a, a solid gut. I've like never really had many gut issues. So I wasn't really focused on like the slow reintroduction of, of anything. Cause I, there, I don't think there was like a single thing that was, is causing me to be ill. Um, imagine, imagine if I found out that just like, if I didn't eat tomatoes, I'd be fine. Like that would be crazy. I'm sure that's happened to some people, but I generally wanted to see if this would change my symptoms in any way. And after three weeks, I saw absolutely no change in my fatigue. Um, but I do think it was an interesting thing to cross off. A lot of the research around long COVID symptoms is that they're caused by inflammation in various parts of the body. So avoiding anything inflammatory should theoretically help. And it does help a lot of people. Um, I'm just generally not, I'm not a very reactive person medically, like medicine doesn't usually have a huge effect on me. I'm not allergic to anything. Um, so I didn't think this would definitely help me, but um, you know, it was a good thing to try. Uh, the next thing I tried was natto, or God, what's the long name? Natto kinzane, kin, kinazine, kin, kinase. Um, this is a herbal supplement. You have to take it in really high doses to see any effect on fatigue. Um, but a lot of people say that it really, really helps them. I took, I don't remember the exact dosage. I'm sorry, I took a lot. <laughs> I took a lot for like a month straight, saw absolutely no improvement. So, and I'm I'm not one to be like, well, maybe it'll work after three months. It's like, it's it's already alternative. I, it didn't work for me. If it works for other people, fantastic, try it. But for me, I just had to move on. One thing I did, which isn't really an intervention, but it's something I noticed makes me feel really good, um, is that we are by the sea. So we often go on, often, I mean, it's January, I haven't been in months, but um, we used to, of a morning, uh, drive down to the sea, because we can park there in the mornings, and go for a dip in the sea. And I really found it increased my energy level. I always felt really good in the water. Maybe it's also because for a lot of that time, like. I can't stand up unsupported. So standing up in water where the water's supporting you like feels really freeing. I don't know whether it's like the sun or the fresh air or the coldness of the water, but I do feel like it kind of shocked my system. And whenever I would do that, I would generally feel really good. Um, and otherwise I feel quite, I usually feel much better later on in the day. Um, I almost always feel crappy in the morning. So um, that was a really great way to start the day. And I bought a large barrel for cold plunging <laughs> and it's been quite a saga. Um, but yeah, basically uh, bought a giant barrel to use as a cold plunge pool to get into that habit more, like being able to do it much more easily at home rather than having to go to the sea, which is nearby, but you know, it's a whole faff. Um, and I have not used it much because of logistical reasons uh, it's like the, at the front of our house because we couldn't get it into our garden and in our new house it will be able to go in the garden. So eventually I'm hoping to be able to commit more fully to cold plunge and I do think that helps me. I don't think it's a cure but I think it's a boost. The final thing I've tried or am currently trying, three days ago I started wearing a nicotine patch. So I'm all patched up. This idea began in January last year where a German doctor published a, a study and a paper about nicotine as a possible cure for long COVID symptoms and ME symptoms. The idea is, and forgive me, I will butcher this, that the spike protein like lodges onto cells in like a particular configuration and nicotine is like way better at lodging onto that. So if you take nicotine, nicotine will like dislodge the spike protein as if, I don't know, is a spike protein still in my system? I don't know. Uh, but that's the sort of logic behind it. And it was backed up by the evidence of um, people were weirdly less likely to die of, lot of COVID and less likely to have long COVID if they were smokers, uh, if you discount all the like respiratory issues, if that makes sense. Um, so basically <laughs> if nicotine, on a population scale did make you slightly less likely to have long COVID. Uh, and in the paper, there were also four case studies of outpatients in his clinic where he administered nicotine patches for like a week on them and it literally all of their symptoms dropped to zero, like over the course of a couple of weeks. It's mind blowing. But it was also a very small study. He was basically saying, this is the good basis for like, let's do a double blind study on this because it it could be interesting, but like there isn't enough data about it yet. So there is a community called the Nicotine Test, um, which is all about basically self-experimenting with nicotine patches to try and improve 
your long COVID symptoms. And it's pretty, it's one of those like Facebook communities where I don't, I just don't know how actually rooted in science a lot of the things that are being said are. Like it's very American and um, it's also obviously quite self-selecting for the people that it is working for. So it's, was when I first found out about this a couple of months ago, I was like, this seems like a, a kind of dumb risky thing to try without proof. But then a few weeks ago on another like long COVID Facebook support group I'm on in the UK, um, a man posted on there that was like similar age to me, had had COVID a similar length of time with a similar le level of severity. And um, like a week before he posted, he said, his doctor had shown him the study and recommended he try it. And it had like transformed him within a week. Um, so I was like, okay, it's time for me to look deeper into this because that's very convincing and I have very similar circumstances to this person. So it turns out the nicotine patches are basically not bad for you. They're not addictive. They don't really have adverse effects on their own. Obviously smoking is bad because of the smoke inhalation in your lungs rather than the drug. And nicotine helps like, because it's a, it's a stimulant, it's a rush, it then gets you addicted to that cycle. But um, doing nicotine patches, a slow release, so you never get that like high. The protocol they recommend is trying out half a patch for two days, going up to a full patch of the lowest dosage you can get, which is seven milligrams. If you were using nicotine patches to try and stop smoking, you would start at 21 milligrams. So it's small amounts um, and you just kind of see what happens. So this has some people this works incredibly for like for long-term use some people it's like they get the real effects of a stimulant for a couple of days feel really great overdo it and then have a huge crash and then some people it's like really managing their dosage over time to see what makes a difference um i am hopeful but as i said before i'm not generally very reactive to medicine um so i don't expect it to have a huge effect on me um, also, I mean, in the original study, they knew what was going to happen. So a lot of that could have been placebo related. And I do think that a lot of the community around this is so like convinced of it as a miracle cure that there may also be some placebo situations <laughs> happening there. And I am just kind of too skeptical to like really believe that this is going to fix me. Um, but for a lot of people, it's like a tool that they can use. Like if they got COVID again, if they're having a particularly bad crash, slap the stimulant on and it will like give them a boost to get through it. So I will report back on this when I see any effects on it, or if I don't see any effects on it, probably in a, a future update video. Um, but I'm, you know, it's, it's cheap, it's self-administered, it's easy, it's not dangerous. Like, why not try it? The only other intervention that I'm interested in doing myself is hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is clinically proven to help MS patients, definitely, um, and ME patients sometimes see improvements on it. So it's literally sitting in like a hyper oxygenated environment for like half an hour to an hour sessions and uh, just getting more oxygen in your body. It's recommended that you do it like four times a week or something like that and you might not see results for months. And it's really expensive apart from if you do it at an MS clinic uh, where then there it's like 20 pounds or something. Um, but you have to do it so much and my nearest one is not very nearby. So weighing up the um, cost benefits of that, uh, I think like the energy of getting myself there, even if there is an improvement, like I might just have used up that energy like trying the therapy, you know? Maybe someday I'll try that. You can get pods that you can rent and use at home, uh, which would be my preference. Um, but again, very expensive. I think you can rent them for maybe 500 pounds a month, but I don't have, I don't have any money to spend on that at the moment. So um, yeah, maybe someday I just wanted to flag that as an option of something that definitely does help some people. All right, that's the end of all our treatments. Uh, now getting on to the admin side of things, I guess. Um, government, community support, right. So uh, personal independence payments. I said at the end of my last video that I had applied for PIP. Um, I My PIP was rejected. I got four points on the daily living and four points for mobility. This is really common. It's really common to have your PIP um, just get a really low score and then you can um, file for mandatory re reconsideration, which is where they just like go through it again. And then if not that, you can appeal, which is another stage. I did the mandatory reconsideration and then um, 
I just never got around to appealing it. I was waiting for this other thing to come through and then it it didn't. So I, I was just kind of waiting and then when I actually wanted to do it, it was too late. So I can totally reapply for that. Um, I just haven't got around to it. Also the day that I had my PIP assessment, it was a video call and I was just having a really good day. So I was sitting up and I was saying like, look, I'm having a really good day here. This is not how I usually am, but I will be able to like, pay attention to this entire video call, which is unusual for me. And in the results, again, that I have here, they basically say in here, oh, you you were great in that meeting, so you're probably fine. <laughs> that was so frustrating. So I think if I do it back, like, I don't wanna lie, but I do want them to understand how severe this could be for me. Um, so I am going to do this again, and I need to um, basically just, turn up on my worst day or like show them what I'm like on my worst day. Yeah, it's also annoying being like, although you reported difficulty walking more than 50 meters due to fatigue, this is inconsistent with your history of conditions showing no musculoskeletal conditions. And it's like, why do I need a musculoskeletal condition to not be able to more, walk more than 50 meters? <laughs> like, why does no one believe in fatigue? It's so annoying. Anyway, that was annoying, but also that that's like quite general. That happens to a lot of people, so that's okay. I applied for a blue badge as well, and I was awarded a blue badge. So this is uh, a disabled parking badge, basically, and I love it so much. It's changed my life. I got it in September. Um, I had the, it was a real life appointment that I had to do. So I had to go to the town hall and have a meeting there. And on this day, I was, oh, I was really bad. Brian had to drive me there. I was like really struggled to even get into the office, had to make a turn all the lights off. Like it was a whole thing. Um, and part of the assessment is that they make you walk like a certain distance. I don't know. I think it was 50 meters and they time it. Um, and that I think it's like literally a yes or no on like, if your, if your problem is, with with your walking speed effectively um they they have like a time that you have to reach and i was just so bad that day. i was going so slowly and i was like i'm pretty sure she's gonna award it to me because i'm because i'm not well it's really increased my independence because now i do drive again and i drive very short distances like i when brian was away and i had to take care of the dog and i wasn't feeling well i would drive the dog to the park park in the disabled spot right at the entrance to the park and even though one time then I still did manage to collapse outside of my car right next to the park. Um, generally, it's just so good. I don't have to be like terrified of driving somewhere and then being like, well, where do I park? I'm gonna have to park really far away and then I'm gonna have to walk and then what do I do about that? Or even like if I'm being driven, if Brian's driving somewhere, the whole thing where like he has to then drop me off and then he has to go find parking and then he has to come back and then like on the other side, I have to wait while he's going to get the car and stuff. It's, a, it's really annoying. Um, so it's just lovely. It's just lovely to have a blue badge. And also we have street parking here. Uh, we like to park our car right outside the house, but it's usually very busy. There's often, if you like return in the evenings, there's no parking spaces on the street. You have to park like two streets down the hill. Like it's not good. Uh, but there are two disabled spots on our road. So we can like park in one of them. It's great. I love it. I love it so much. And it was also one of those things that was just really validating to have like some body <laughs> so, some but some so, like someone but also like some like government or local council whatever somebody like recognize that i'm not well on a similar level i also have an access card uh which is like a private scheme it's a charity um where it's associated with a lot of like music venues and that kind of stuff they have like a bunch of different categories of like what you can and can't do and i was awarded one for basically not being able to stand in line and needing someone else with me. Um, because I was I was dead set on going to Thorpe Park for my birthday. I turned 30 last year and I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something, you know? I wanted to do something exciting and fun and I didn't want to be like confined to my little sad thing. And I was like, I wanna go to Thorpe Park, to this theme park, um, but I don't know how I do that because I'm really exhausted all the time. <laughs> but I got this access card um so i could get a ride access pass which basically like skips you to the front of queues but you sort of queue after the fact on your own time it's it's hard to explain um but we got to thought park and i was in i was wheeled around all day in a wheelchair got to skip to the front of everything it was actually quite a bad day because it was really rainy and brian it turns out hates roller coasters <laughs> um but it was when that when i got that i got that before the blue badge so i got it in june or july it was just really validating to have someone be like yeah you are unwell and then if anyone not that 
this actually happens. But if anyone came up to me and was like, you you don't look disabled, I'd be like, here's a card that proves that I am. Um, and I've used it a couple times to get free plus one tickets to things basically. Um, so a lot of uh, gigs or comedy events or like Pride, for example, um, I get a free plus one because I, it's it's showing like she can't physically like go somewhere on her own, like it's dangerous for her to do so. Um, so probably saved a bit of money there as well. So it's a good tip. It costs some amount of money to get, I think 20 pounds, 25 pounds, I'll put it here. Um, but I I recoup the cost of that like immediately. So it's great. Okay, next I want to talk about work and money and the other really tragic things that are happening in my life. But we're gonna take a pause. We're gonna come back in like an hour. I'm gonna eat some food. I'm gonna have a little lie down and I'll see you in a bit. 